Welcome to the IPX True North Podcast, where we connect people, processes, and tools. Well, Nate, um, here we are doing our podcast again, uh, a little different for our audience, for our listeners, and for our viewers. Uh, we're actually live uh, at the Purdue campus, and uh, Nate, again, thanks for joining us. Uh, looking forward to this. Really excited uh, opportunity. Uh so thank you for the invitation. And um, if you would, just give our, our, our audience, our listeners, our viewers, a little background of where we're at, um, uh, the building we're in, a lot of fantastic history here, and uh, we'll go from there. Sure. Thanks, Joe. Uh, good to be back again. Um, for everybody who's watching, we're actually here at uh, Purdue University. We decided to do this on campus this time. Uh, we are sitting uh, in uh, one of the uh, reception areas at the Dauk Alumni Center uh, here at Purdue. It's named after uh, Richard Dauk, who is uh, particularly important to uh, American manufacturing. Uh, he formed uh, the American Axle Company uh, some years ago, and uh, his family still uh, still runs that today. And so um, we're taking advantage of a nice room and a quiet location and uh, moving away from a, <laughs> from a virtual recording. So uh, that's where we are today. Fantastic. It's a beautiful building, beautiful campus. For those of you that have uh, been to the university, uh, the expansion, uh, uh, Nate and I were talking about this earlier, over the last 20 years is just, I mean, it's actually, I can't describe it. It's just uh, been an amazing transformation. There's a lot of history at Purdue. I, I got here early today, walked around. I've been to campus many times over the last uh, couple of decades, but a lot of astronauts, a, a lot of, a lot of brain power. Um, was developed and nurtured here at Purdue and, and and just just an amazing campus. And again, thank you for the invite. I was actually here last week, I believe, uh, at an event for at the Digital Enterprise Center. Mm -hmm. um, great uh, symposium. If it's okay with you, Nate, I'd like to talk a little bit about that. I'd like to talk about uh, maybe the the manufacturing facility. Um, that I've I've had the opportunity to visit as well, and uh, we'll kind of tie that into some things that are going on. Sure, sure. So I'll, I'll just give a brief um, overview of what happened last week, and also then just a brief overview overview of the center. So uh, as Joe referred to the Digital Enterprise Center, so one of the the many hats that I wear here uh, is director of the Digital Enterprise Center. Um, we typically have a fall and a spring symposium. So last week was our fall symposium. Uh, the topic was around uh, the use of models and uh, the connection between models and requirements across the life cycle uh, to enable digital thread methods and tools. And so we uh, had a series of panelists and speakers. Uh, Joe was one of the speakers. And uh, we talked a lot about how the alignment between requirements in the early part of the life cycle and the models that we build, and then ultimately the products that we produce, um, that the maintenance of that alignment over the life cycle is critically important, especially in today's world when we talk about concepts like the digital thread or the digital twin. Um, you know, clear requirement definitions and, um, you know, I would say persistent alignment. So when we talk about, you know, the connection between models and requirements and the need to maintain them, uh, through the life cycle, you know, it's it's critically important that that connection persist, particularly when you talk about data translations, when you talk about OEM and supplier relationships, when you talk about business and contractual elements that uh, that are legally binding, you know, the, all of it translates uh, into sort of one common denominator, which is we need to make sure that requirements align to our models, which align to our systems, which align to our functioning products. Uh, throughout the life cycle. So that was the the gist of, of the fall symposium last week. Um, you asked a little bit about the center. Um, so the Digital Enterprise Center was created, um, gosh, it's probably 20 years ago now. Um, at Purdue, we've been working in this sort of this PLM and digital enterprise space for a long time. Um, I've been the, I was not the original director, but I've been the, the current director now for about 12 years, 13 years, somewhere in there. And um, the center functions as, a, as an industry consortium. We have uh, industry partners that fund the research work that goes on there. And really, uh, these are, are common things, uh, pre-competitive things that um, 
each company has a concern about. Each company has a need to try to somehow solve the problem. And, and so a lot of our, our solutions, if you will, are often um, working demonstrations that, that tend to combine um, software tools with some sort of process or, or methodology and then some sort of a, of a defined data set that um, would be representative of the sorts of things that, that those companies would use. And uh, we have quite a few graduate students that have come through our program over the last number of years. Um, good success rates with hiring. Some of them go on to, you know, uh, master's or PhD programs somewhere else. Some of them go into industry. Uh, some stay here for additional graduate school. It really just kind of depends on the person. But, um, but yeah, that's how the, how the center functions. You know, and the thing I've always found fascinating about the center and, you know, I'd like to expand upon it a little is... It's a lot of students, you know, um, bringing these advanced capabilities, whether it's technology processes to these organizations and, and the investment, you know, from my experience, I've been on both sides of the house. Um, the ROI on that is profound yeah. um, because there's, it's, it's kind of a two or three for one. Not only do you have the investment, the relationship with the university, you're getting your deliverables, you're meeting those objectives, you're getting that research and or that that asset um, that you've paid for in theory, but you're also building this rapport with students and potentially your future workforce. And for me, that's something I've sure. always thought was fascinating, which was, and, and I think it's something that could be expanded on and it should be, um, these partnerships, much like you have um, with many of the organizations you work with today, I could name drop a few of them. I don't know if that's kosher or not, but these are, these are large, large organizations within industry, within the uh, military. And you're talking a lot of great, great discussions, great research is happening. Um, but the one thing I found fascinating at this last symposium, and I, as you know, I've, I've been joining the symposium now, um, for a while, um, over a decade. Um, and I've been speaking about things that I'm finally seeing organizations start to talk about. And instead of it just being IT and technology and new tools and the, the need for digital, it's now we realize we have to invest in from ideation to decommission and in requirements into our processes. And that needs to be uh, interoperable with our technology. And, and I think that's where a lot of companies have failed is they thought technology was just a, a simple flip of the button. And then there's an investment there, not just from a financial perspective, but time um, to do it correctly. And these, these speakers uh, and, and the open discussions, I, I found fascinating because, you know, it's uh, no surprise uh, I find um, uh, requirements and process excellence to be, you know, priority one for the sustainability and scalability of an organization. Um, so when I start to hear organizations at least understand that they need to invest in it, I get a little mm -hmm. excited. Um, can you tie a little bit of your perspective on this maybe new sense of, uh-oh, we've, we forgot about this or, uh-oh, we've got a, you know, we've hidden this under the bed or under the rug for too long why do you feel like organizations uh, and individuals are starting to grasp on the fact that we've got to do something, we got to do something now? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, you know, I'll say, I'll maybe answer this from a couple different directions. I remember very early on when we started doing symposia here at Purdue for the Digital Enterprise Center around some of these kinds of topics, a lot of our early symposiums were about some kind of a technology. Uh, again, it was 20-ish years ago. And so at that point, a lot of technologies were in the, some of their early stages. People were just beginning to understand them, just beginning to adopt them. And so part of what we were doing was, was simply trying to raise a, awareness that maybe some kind of a technology is out there. It might have some utility for an organization. It might not. You know, But over the last 10, 12 years, we've seen a lot of those technologies mature. We've seen other newer technologies come along in some cases to replace those. And so now we've sort of shifted. And, and a lot of this is in response to our, our industry partners who, who fund us, you know, the kinds of topics they want to hear about. And to your point earlier, it was, it was 
large organizations that tend to fund us. And, and to be fair, you know, Purdue is not necessarily unique in that space. There are a lot of industry and university partnerships around the country. But the, I guess my point being is that um, early on, we did focus on technology, but I also think we're beginning to see a situation in industry where folks have realized, okay, technology isn't going to solve all my problems. And in fact, if I don't use it well, it's probably going to create more problems than it solves. And so <clears throat> what's left after that? Well, you can talk about things like organizational restructuring, and some people do that in order to solve some of these sort of epical challenges, right, that you that you think of when you think of things like digital transformation. Some people say, oh, well, we got to we got to reorganize. Well, maybe, right? And that's certainly one option. Um, but again, that's time consuming. It's expensive, right? It's disconcerting to the to the people who work there, disconcerting potentially to your customers. Uh, you know, it is maybe it's adopt more technology or different technology. I suppose that's another approach. Um, again, it's expensive, may not always go the way you want it to go. Um Sometimes a, a company that creates that technology is, you know, here today and gone tomorrow, as they say. And so what is it that can persist after all of those things um, have their novelty wear off? Well, it's usually process and practice methodologies. It's usually things that have to do with the human interactions inside your organization. And so I believe what we're in what we're seeing now is the realization for organizations that, you know, the technologies that we tend to use in the, in the context of these sorts of podcast conversations are um, they've, they have reached a certain state of maturity and, you know, folks may have squeezed out of them as much as they can squeeze out of them in terms of the, the, uh, the initial effect, the initial, raise in performance or the initial um, efficiency gain or what have you that's brought on by a new technology that maybe you or a few others are using and you're now ahead of your competitors, right? That, that effect has, has now, I believe for some people worn off. And so now it's a matter of, all right, we've, we've commonly adopted these technologies into our organization. So now what? And people are beginning to see, you know, gaps in their workflows, gaps in their communications, gaps in their support of their product over a life cycle, gaps in their interactions with their customers. You know, technology isn't necessarily going to fix all that. And so going back to basics, if you will, and looking at requirements, looking at interactions between people. You know, one of the common things that came up last week in the symposium was looking at the interfaces between folks across or functions, if you will, maybe not even people, but just functions across the life cycle. Um, you know, those are the important things that people are beginning to do now. And with and in doing that, they need they need a framework other than just here's the technology and its user guide, you know, go off and prosper. Right. It's they need more of a framework that, that deals with, I think, the humanistic as well as the process and practice piece of their organization. Yeah. And I, I mean, of course, you know this. I mean, you're kind of speaking. I mean, I, I drink that Kool-Aid. Um, for me, it's, and you've heard me say this, you're going to get tired of me saying a lot of these words. But when the, that whole digital transformation phrase was first introduced, um, I saw the merit, but I also know, and, and you know this as well, we've lived this, as many of you have, um, the marketing takes over and the branding takes over. And then money is being uh, uh, burned left and right um, because we, we're now scared and we've got to invest in digital transformation or we're not going to survive. And, um, you know, from my seat, you know, from the IPX perspective, I, I know we were one of the first organizations to come out and say, whoa, slow down a little bit, because it's not just about digital transformation. You're going to get lost in that fog if you think it's just throwing money at IT tools. That's not what digital transformation meant uh, when it was first introduced. And I and I apologize, I don't remember who first coined the phrase. And, and it's definitely not what it means now. But from an IPX perspective, Nate, you've heard this again, I apologize. We've always said 
It's about your ecosystem DNA. It's about an evolution about your organization. And, and why I say it that way is because Nate's touching on all those elements. Um, you have to understand that as a state across your ecosystem. And, and the one area I want to uh, relate and, and maybe use as a scenario uh, with the Digital Enterprise Center. Um, so let's hypothetically, let's, let's scenario this out. Um, I'm an organization. I, I'm funding. Uh, we have a partnership. We deliver uh, a clear, concise, and valid requirements um, to you uh, for the deliverable, what we're looking for. Um, some time goes by, you uh, achieve uh, the objective, and you deliver upon that those requirements. Um, the next stage, and from your perspective, I believe, uh, this is me only right now, this is where a lot of companies fail. And I, I do believe it's what you were discussing. So now we have something that we know we could use. Where a lot of organizations fail is not investing in the framework, the expertise, and the knowledge of actually making that tangible for us. How do we deploy this technology, this process improvement across all of our sites, across our entire workforce? And from a digital uh, enterprise center, do you have a relationship or entity that helps deploy that? So define the business engagement requirements. Um, the process and policy and procedure uh, documents that are going to need to be updated. All those artifacts, the training, making it functional, not just the IT user training. You know, from your perspective, from a scenario, our organization's understanding when we deliver an asset, there's still a lot of work to be done. I would like to think they are, but, but I'm not sure. Yeah. To be honest, I, I, you know, if we do a project with an organization, I would say most of the time there is some sort of, of technology or tools element mm -hmm. to the project. There's typically some kind of a data element to the project. There's also some sort of human interaction or even human intervention element to the project. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily call it training per se, but one of the things, especially um, one of the mandates that we have here at Purdue through a few different organizations is to work with companies inside Indiana. Uh, obviously we're based in, or we're located in Indiana. So, you know, we work with our constituents, right. but, um, but there are a lot of organizations in Indiana that are not large corporations, you know, the, the OEMs of the world, if you will. I mean, we have some, but I doubt that they're the majority. Um, and so a lot of, in a lot of cases, the a smaller company that, that might come to us seeking help or guidance, advice, whatever it might be, um, we might be able to show them something. And then, so now there's a question of, of implementation. Right. Um, there are groups within Purdue, um, the technology assistance program, the manufacturing extension partnership, uh, NMAC. There's a, there's a number of groups within Purdue that, that can uh, at various times help with implementation. Now, to be fair, we are not a systems integrator. We're not staffed that way. We're not funded that way. But what I see, you know, going back to your to your question, you know, what I see is that there is often a need for some kind of an assist. Mm -hmm on the implementation and, and integration of really of, of methods and practices. Um, often technology today is reasonably well integrated um, in certain areas, right? Sometimes you, there's a little bit of configuration that has to be done. Sometimes even customization that has to be done, but by and large, I, I have found anyway that the companies, whether they be large or small, can deal with the technology once they have some level of understanding of it. It's often the what comes next, to your point, that is where they will need some help. And so one of the things we have helped organizations with in the past has been um, developing what a use case or a scenario could look like. And, you know, whether an organization partners with a local university or whether they partner with a systems integrator, whether they partner with, you know, the, the vendor of a, of a technology, I, it, it, 
to me, that doesn't matter as much as, as it does, as does, I should say, um, just getting that help, getting that assist, right? Because just standing up the technology is one thing, but to actually put it to use is another. And the, and wrestling with some of those decisions about, you know, do I customize versus configure, mm-hmm. right? Do I try to modify the technology or, you know, do I try to modify what I think my process is to better fit the technology? You know, sometimes it's actually easier to modify and even less expensive to modify your process or the way that you work right. sometimes than it is to try to modify the technology. You know, and that's an important thing. We always <clears throat> typically, and I, I'm sure most of our listeners, um, we're all cut from a similar cloth, especially if you're listening to this podcast. Um, you know, we talk about, you know, processes lead, tools follow. And and I think what you're saying sometimes, to me, it's always been hybrid. Um, yes, your processes should uh, be the requirements for your tools. But at the end of the day, if those are legacy processes, they're not modern processes. And honestly, I, I think there's there's one element that many of us leave out that, that really causes the biggest um, roadblock. It's legacy mindsets um, mm-hmm. within organizations, small and large. Um, <clears throat> we deal with it all the time where and you got a new IT tool solution. <clears throat> has a lot of opportunity. Um, you have the ability to modify your processes. Most organizations know they need to do that. Um, but it's that legacy mindset that'll never work here because we're different. Um, that's one of my, uh, <clears throat> I guess, personal uh, salt to the eye comment when I hear someone say, well, that'll that'll never work here. We're different than them. The reality is you're not. Right. You, you make product or you have a service doesn't matter what product you design doesn't really matter what service uh you have uh you offer to the community uh, at large you're still an organization and and there's a lot of best practices that can be utilized but it's that legacy mindset and sometimes it's almost a security blanket as behavior from my perspective where it just gets in a way it clouds judgment it clouds vision um and honestly uh, and again uh this is Joe Anderson's perspective, uh, not endorsed by Purdue or Nate, Dr. Nate Hartman in any way. Um, I think it stifles true innovation. You know, I, I think these mindsets, when you look at true, like game changing innovation and evolution of a product, there's not a lot going on uh, within certain industries. Now, there's some, don't get me wrong, uh, what we've seen over the last few years is fascinating, but there's some where you go, is that all you have? You know, you're you're a large OEM. Is that is that really all we got? Um, what I'd like to do is, and if it's okay with you, and, and absolutely okay to say no, based on that word of innovation, can you kind of touch into the uh, the NMAC Association and, and what's going on here um, at the lab and the facility I've been at? Are are you okay discussing sure. a little bit of that? Sure. Yeah. Um- it's a, so innovation is an interesting word. You know, folks throw that word around a lot. And, and I think it's one of those words that to some degree is in the eye of the beholder, right? I mean, there's a dictionary definition, but then there's also how does that manifest in, right. in practical terms? And so one of the things that you talked about, though, was this idea of legacy mindsets. And, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit maybe about workforce development here as a way to to kind of bridge into, yeah. into what we're doing is that, um, you know, when folks think about digital transformation and this sort of social as well as industrial movement of, of this fourth industrial revolution that we're in, um, folks all around the world are experiencing that. Uh, you know, it's not just a U.S. phenomenon, uh, not just a localized phenomenon. Everywhere around the world is experiencing this. And you know, some of us experience it, um, it, you know, in an educational realm, some of us experience it in an industrial realm, but all of us in, in whatever realm we experience it are having to come to the realization, I think, that, you know, information and this idea of cyber physical or, or combined environments, if you will, is really at the heart of this fourth industrial revolution and how we leverage that 
information, the cyber physical systems and the like, how we use that to make decisions. And to your point, decision making is often one of those things in an organization that is either excruciatingly slow or in some cases too darn fast. And so we sort of need the the Goldilocks version of decision making, right? right. We need the, the one that's just right. Well, given this idea of connected ecosystems, connected products, uh, digital twins, if you will, um, the kinds of things that these cyber physical systems allow us to do definitely requires um, what I'm going to call flexibility and mindset. And we've done some work recently with NMAC, the Indiana Manufacturing Competitiveness Center. That's, I guess, one of the other hats that I wear is co-director of, of that center uh, with another colleague here at Purdue. Um, the, uh, we've really looked at workforce and, 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 and in fact have done a couple uh, projects with corporations on looking at their workforce. And, and what does say, uh, um, now to be fair, it's been around manufacturing, you know, not healthcare or energy right. or what have you per se, it's been around manufacturing, but the, the general premise was so, what does someone who's going to work in one of these 21st century manufacturing environments, what kinds of skills and knowledge and attributes do they need? Right. And yes, there are obviously things with, you know, physical dexterity and the like. However, the fact that most of this is digital or most of the emphasis here is digital and even virtual at that, we're opening up opportunities to join the workforce for people with differences in ability right. that has not been available to us in up until the most recent past. Absolutely. Secondly, um, what we're seeing from a, a workforce development related uh, perspective within NMAC is that um, we really see two things. Right. The one is the pyramid, which is the incumbent workforce. And how do we upscale or rescale, or excuse me, upskill or reskill, mm -hmm. uh, or in some other way train uh, a workforce that is both existing and then new? And the new is the pipeline. Right. And in many cases, um, many people look at K-12 or maybe K through 16, you know, baccalaureate degree as the pipeline, um, regardless of which time frame you put on it, you know, it's essentially still the pipeline. That's a much more longitudinal, longer term view of the workforce. Yet it needs just as much investment right. if we're going to realize the potential of these technologies, as does the pyramid need investment. Agreed. And so one of the things we're doing is looking at all the way down to the elementary school level, looking at things like math education, science education, but also to some degree systems education. And while there often are not many, uh, if any, uh, educational standards in a state uh, written for systems education, it comes up throughout a number of the educational standards, particularly those that relate to social studies, science, and to some degree math. And I think it's this systems view that will become increasingly important because while previous industrial revolutions dealt with um, automation of human labor, mm -hmm. the fourth industrial is sort of this jumping off point, at least in my opinion, where we think about automation of human thought, human decision-making. And I'm not advocating for machines replacing humans. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that machines, computing in particular, are able to process information and assimilate information faster in some cases than human beings are. Absolutely. Now, are they prone to error? Yes. Are But... Are humans prone to error? Yes. The challenge, though, or maybe not challenge, but the opportunity is arguably they're prone to different kinds of error. Mm -hmm. And so the reason I'm bringing all this up as it relates to what you asked about the lab is that from a workforce perspective, we're really trying to address what are some of the preparatory skills 
that students are, are going to need as they move through elementary school to middle school to high school. And so we look at this from an elementary perspective and to some degree a middle school perspective where we deal with design and innovation studios. That's a model that we've built out here at NMAC over the last three or four years. We've had a number of companies adopt this within their or uh, facilities for their employees, but we've also had them partner with schools around, uh, around them. And right now uh, we have about 30 of these design and innovation studios scattered across elementary schools in Indiana. By the end of next year, by the end of 2023, we'll actually have twice that many. And at that point now, we've built out an ecosystem where we're connecting the teachers, the administrators, the students, the parents in there to form this community of practice around design and innovation studios. We're trying to offer the teachers uh, support so that really they don't have to struggle with the technology because to be fair, uh, they were all trained as teachers, not as, as designers or engineers or manufacturers or what have you. And so we're trying to give them support so that they can, what they can really focus on is teaching their students the content that they need to teach them but doing it with modern tools, with modern methods, with modern systems. And, and I think it's really, Joe, in my mind, when you talk about people's legacy mindset, legacy mindsets often dealt with, I have a discrete task and this is what I need to do. Without much understanding, without sometimes, in some cases, much awareness of what happened outside of whatever your discrete task was. Right. Uh, we, the connectedness of our future environments won't really allow that to happen very much. And so when you couple that connectedness with cognitive automation, or at least support for cognitive automation to help make better decisions faster, and with a much more tech savvy and tech literate workforce coming up through the system, just by default, I mean, let alone anything we might do intentionally, right? Right. It, that means we're going to have to really have a good understanding of systems. Uh, and I don't necessarily mean in like a mathematical modeling kind of way, although that's important, but it's more about how to work within a system, how to thrive within a system, how to understand the implications of your action on someone else and vice versa within a system. Right. You know, and I know we're, we're coming to an end, but there's a couple of things you, you, you've stated that I, I look forward to talking about during the next session is one is cognitive automation and, and what that really means. I want to kind of peel that onion back a little bit because we're, and as you stated, it's not, it's not stating that we're a proponent of replacing the human operator. Um, it, it's actually, it's a evolution, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's upskilling in a way or reskilling, but there's some, some things there within a subjectivity of data and cognitive uh, automation that I want to talk about, you know, is, is there an importance to still have some uh, guardrails mm -hmm. for uh, subjectivity when it comes to that, um, that level of automation, but what you're doing um, kind of through this K through 12 is fascinating. It's one area, um, as you're aware, we're looking at, I think part of your systems is also one thing that's not being taught, honestly, you know, from my perspective, from K through 16, is, is that those interconnected processes mm -hmm. and, and understanding that you have all these systems, you have all this data, you have all these tools, you have all this technology, but you still have to be able to communicate. Right. You still have to be able to have information that's actually valid. You and I were having discussion and it also, you have to know the source and, and, and in a day and a time where information is kind of thrown at us and, and some people just digest it as it's good. Um, and we all know that's not the case. Um, I think in, in a professional setting and, and as we're looking at our future workforce, it's, it's all of our jobs going back to this legacy right. mindset is hold ourselves accountable and, and ensure that the data that that we're providing, the information that we're providing to our future workforce is actually good goods. And it actually brings me to something um, on a cup holder here. I got here earlier and I snooped around and, and, and read all the history. There's this fascinating place. If you ever uh, in the area, I highly recommend you stopping in, but there's a good quote here and I wish I could have remembered it, but just a, a, a little, uh, uh, 
cup coaster. holder coaster <laughs> that I found earlier. But it's uh, uh, for John Perdue. Education was the flame that lit the world, and that's from Irina Scott. Um, I found that quote fascinating, and I'd I'd like to you know close out this podcast on talking about that. It's you know for me, it's it's not just education, but I think from John, he had a more holistic view than a lot of maybe uh, us in the professional world. Sometimes education is just a, a means for the next step to, to get a career. For me, education, going back to that, that word that we, that we use a lot at IPX, that evolution of thought and learning, education for John or Mr. Purdue um, at that time was continual. Mm-hmm. And, it, and, and education and research and process excel, excellence, that's an evolution. That's continual improvement. And, and that's why I find that quote so fascinating because it's still relevant today. Education, research, process excellence, those are the sparks and the flames that keeps all of this going. And, and I think, you know, I'm almost preaching Um I think we owe it to the future workforce and it's why I'm so fascinated with what you're doing um, at that level for these, for these schools. And I hope it, I hope it catches, I hope that spark, that flame catches and spreads into other States, but you know, for our audience, you know, I hope, and and it was my challenge uh, at the symposium last week, network uh, with these individuals, with these visionaries, with, with, with people like Dr. Hartman and, and, and I think we could take that spark and, and we can make it a flame again when we're talking about an evolution of education and research and, and process excellence. So with that, I'm, I'm going to close. I, I do look forward to the next se- session. You're, you're going to see an evolution of this as well. Um, I do think we'll talk about cognitive automation uh, most likely. Uh, but as you know, if you've listened to uh, Nate and I uh, in the past, um, I can't guarantee that will be the case. Um, <laughs> But Nate, thanks again for offering up this uh, beautiful location. Thanks for joining me. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Joe, for having me again. And I'll look forward to our next conversation and, and look forward to more folks joining us in the future. Fantastic. Thank you for tuning in today. Don't forget to subscribe and review the show. And for more information on IPX, visit IPXHQ.com.